Hello there. It's a hot day today here in Seattle. I believe in some places it was up, in some areas of Seattle it was up in the 90s. Uh, today is the 12th of June and I'm Paul Glumas and this is being brought to you by General Welfare Presents. Okay, tonight I'm going to do uh, two pictures. One I call the big picture, and the second one I call the bigger picture. Okay, so I'll start with the big picture. Okay, the big picture is that what Lyndon LaRouche laid out extensively in a very uh, strategic book called The Earth's Next 50 Years, which was published in 20. 2005, which was 14 years ago, uh, which involves uh, uh, two, three essays. Uh, uh, one essay is, the, is the, the coming Eurasian century. The other essay is on, on the coming uh, Dialogue of Civilizations, Treaty of Westphalia. And, and this Earth's next 50 years is describes essentially the future of the world that was that he was involved in creating going back to the late 80s, the late 70s, the late 80s, the late 90s, and, and especially in this period uh, uh, from about the late uh, 90s into the late uh, er, first decade of the, t the 21st century. And this coming Eurasian world is now taking place. Okay? And what LaRouche was putting forward what, on the cultural level, on the economic level, on the political level, on the strategic level, is the emergence uh, 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 of a Eurasian Pacific century. And the way this works is the following. You have the Dialogue of Civilizations, the conference that occurred on May 15th in, 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 in Beijing on uh, the Dialogue of Civilizations or the Asian Dialogue of Civilizations took place. Uh, Helga spoke 10 minutes at it and she submitted a, 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 a uh, very important uh, paper. And this is the coming together of Asia locating their identity in their roots, in their ancient cultural roots, but at the same time locating that identity in progress, sci scientific and technological progress. Then you have the economic side of it, which is what Lynn proposed, Lyndon LaRouche proposed in the uh, early 90s, uh, which was the, this new Silk Road or the Eurasian Land Bridge. And so that's coming into being. And the third comes the, 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 the security issues. Uh, that conference is occurring this weekend in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, where China, Russia, India, Pakistan, Iran, all these countries that are part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are going to uh, deliberate on the security of the people of this whole area. And what are they securing uh, their people from? From international terrorism, one from economic warfare to and so forth and so on. Now the strategic partnership that has emerged was seen last weekend at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum where Xi Jinping was the guest of honor and there were many many consolidations of a very close working relationship between Russia and China. And in that conference, uh, Putin said some things that were absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, he said, first of all, that the global unipolar world, the global system, is disintegrating, is degenerating. And this is causing the instabilities uh, in the world. Number two, he is saying that the financial system that went through the crisis of 
those issues were not resolved and are now coming back the the issues were merely kicked down the road so he's alluding to the financial situation the third thing that he said is that you need a new system you need to reorganize the existing system and that reorganization must respect the developmental pathway of each sovereign nation and it must be transparent and open okay so so now you have all of these things coming together and the vector into something called the G20 meeting in Osaka Japan uh, this a month at the end of this month the 28th and 29th where Trump has said that he will be meeting with Xi Jinping and with uh, Putin at that meeting now this is very important because what's being discussed, not in the media, but what's being discussed is a new financial architecture. This is what LaRouche has been laying out. And we know this also in a negative sense. Because yesterday, <coughs> the core British Empire uh, academic think tank crowd called Chatham House put out a call for a new Bretton Woods. Now they wouldn't be putting out a call for a new Bretton Woods, a new agreement among nations, if they did not know already that their process is going on and that they want to get, the British Empire wants to get their fingers into that, wants to play with it, wants to, so they're now gearing up their assets all over the world to then weigh in on the dialogue that's going on over what's going to happen with the with the financial system meanwhile the crisis is getting worse and the crisis with the financial system is being exacerbated by the trade crisis between china and the united states this is causing instability the big uh detonator right now is not mortgage-backed securities as it was in 2007 2008 but it's uh, leverage corporate debt. Leverage corporate debt is at the center of this financial situation and with the instability being created by Trump's uh, tariffs on uh, China and this whole trade dispute that's going on, this is causing a negative effect in the economy and that is causing a threatened blowout of the financial system and that is why all of a sudden they, all the central banks are now reversing their positions from we're going to raise the interest rates a little bit to no, we're going to lower the interest rates. We're going to go back to quantitative easing, which means they are thinking that we're very close to a blowout, which is why they're going again for quantitative easing, which is massive uh, pumping of, of financial liquidity into the system, which only uh, postpones things a little bit but creates an even bigger bubble, an even bigger uh, debt bubble, and so forth and so on. But they don't have control over Trump. They don't have control over Xi Jinping. They don't have control over Putin. They don't even have control over Modi of India. So, or even of Abe of Japan. So you have a tremendous, a tremendous situation developing in this uh, going in to the, to, to the G20 meeting. And um, you're getting a, an entirely psychotic response to all of this from Mike Pompeo, uh, from Mike Pence, and most of all from, from, from Bolton. Now we have word that Bolton has been completely discredited inside the uh, National Security uh, a, uh, uh, Agency, a National Security Council, and that there is now a, a disintegration going on inside the National Security Council. Anyhow, uh, so so that's that's the kind of situation, and then you have uh, the discovery that all of the people in the Obama administration were involved in this whole operation against Trump, including the people involved in the Ukrainian coup, people like Victoria ne uh, Nealon and and Weiner, uh, who worked with Victoria Newland on the Ukrainian situation in the State Department and who was working very closely with Christopher Steele throughout the whole period of the Ukrainian situation as well as later uh, the whole uh, Steele dossier period 
So this is all one element, one entity. The British uh, uh, intelligence service led by Sir Richard Dearlove, who ran it in the early part of the decade, first decade. Uh, Christopher Steele was, his, was running the Russia desk of this whole thing. So the whole Russia thing is all about that. Now, so that's all coming out. To the point that on Tucker Carlson, uh, the proposal was made that perhaps Obama should be brought in to be subpoenaed for, for testimony because, because he was uh, definitely, you know, all, all roads seemed to lead to him. So you have a battle now emerging over this whole question. It's going to get nastier. Uh, it, uh, Barr and, and, and Dur Durham are going to go after this stuff. And it's not going to go away. But the, but, and the Democrats are in a situation where they're, they have no, they feel they have no other options but to go with impeachment. To go with impeachment. And, and, and use that to try to stay afloat. Not that they're going to succeed, but they're, they're treading water. In the middle of all this, the, uh, the, the Massachusetts senator uh, labeled Pocahontas by uh, Elizabeth Warren has come out with a patriotic industrial development policy, which is the first sign of any kind of, of sane policy coming from the Democrats. But that's all part of her presidential campaign. Whether she'll be allowed to, 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 to maintain a Trump-like policy in the uh, economic policy in the um, in in the race uh, is another story. Uh, we haven't seen it, it being sc sc screwed over and turned into a green agenda thing. They they all can say, well, we want an industrial policy, but it's a green industrial policy, which means you ain't gonna. It's not an industrial. There is no industrial policy in a green industrial policy. Industrial policy means infrastructure, it means nuclear power, it means uh, huge projects, it means uh, reviving your manufacturing to provide the uh, capital goods for those projects and so forth and so on. That's a different policy. That's not a green policy. Green policy is a different policy. <coughs> now what's become very clear is that 90% of the trade agreement that was being worked on had been worked out between Trump and, 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 and China, between the, 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 uh, the Treasury Secretary and China. And then the whole thing gets uh, scuttled in April. And the reason it was scuttled was the people who scuttled it are not interested in a trade agreement. They're interested either in total economic surrender of China or war. So that's where that stands. So that whole anti-China thing, you know, is now huge. The FBI is going after all of these students. The FBI is going after visiting scholars. The FBI, the, they're going after Huawei, which is a technological leader in merging in 5G. And what's happening is that most countries are adopting fi uh, Huawei. Even our own uh, um, acting director of the budget uh, is saying hold off for two years because we are totally entwined with Huawei's in our more rural areas because they're providing services that no other no US uh, company can do so 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 this Huawei thing is completely backfiring especially in Latin America all the Latin American countries are lining up to get on Huawei all of Russia is going to be integrated 5G by Huawei and so on and so forth now that's the, the big picture the big picture is we are moving into the, the issue of what will be the replacement to the current financial system. That's not just an idea coming from Lyndon LaRouche anymore. That is on the table. You would not have Chatham House doing this routine if it wasn't on the table behind the scenes. Okay. So that's the big picture. Okay. Now we get into the even bigger picture. And that is the emergence and convergence between China, Russia, India, and the U.S. on a scientific industrial development of the moon pers perspective. 
this is not the space program as it was under bush and 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 obama this is a different space program and what china is doing in going to the far side of the moon and what china is doing is preparing to harvest the helium 3 on the moon which will eventually be the primary source for fusion power once fusion is developed the russians have the same in interests and so do the indians the indians have a serious space program the Russians have had a serious space program. Uh, we rely on them for um, for launching a lot of our, our satellites. And the Chinese have a, a serious space pro program. And finally, the United States has finally has a serious space program. And uh, this is the bigger picture. Because this is the future that will or future the future that will organize the economic activity beyond the belt and road beyond the infrastructure and the trade and the expansion of of living standards on a global scale the eradication of poverty this is the bigger picture that will organize the scientific breakthroughs that have to be made like fusion propulsion you cannot go to the moon you cannot take 3 months to go to the moon forget it you got to develop fusion propulsion. Yeah, you can go to the moon in three uh, three days, but you can't go to Mars and me, Mars in Mars in three years. You can't do that. You you we have the United States has sent rovers to Mars. They have landed on Mars quite a few times, but that's not the same thing as developing a working industrial capability on the moon, and then using that industrial capability and that as a base to go to Mars and you're going to need fusion propulsion or nuclear propulsion and this is where we're going but you're also going to need a number of scientific revolutions in medicine how to maintain uh, a gravitational and geomagnetic uh, uh, environment for human existence in space you're going to have to develop very sophisticated medical technologies for that. Uh, you're going to have to develop all kinds of different technologies. And this is where the future economic development is going to come out of that. And all of these four countries are now committed to the same orientation. It will not, it's not a law, big step and a hop that they might get together and say, well, let's, let's share our resources on this so we, we, can, we can work it together. But, but that's secondary. What's primary is our youth. Our youth are languishing, especially in Europe and the United States and Canada. They're languishing in a lack of a vision of the future. When you don't have a vision as a child of what you would want to become or what you want to be, you are a prey to, to the moment. You are a prey to the culture. You are a prey to your Facebook page. You are a prey to drugs. You are a prey to everything. Because you don't have a direction. But once you create that direction, this generation that's coming in now, they're 14, 15, 16, 17, maybe a little younger, maybe a little older, 20, up until the early 20s, we will call them the Artemis generation. Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo, who is also the goddess of the moon. This is the, this is the new generation that is required. The Artemis generation. And, and in India, this is developing. In Russia, this is developing. In China, this is developing. And now it has to develop also in the United States. This, this idea that this is where the future lies. And that is the, the bigger picture that will yield the means of uni unifying. But then in the whole process of this, you will begin to develop a different identity. Not an identity merely, I am Chinese. Yes, you are Chinese. Or I am an American. Yes, you are an American. Or I'm a Russian. Rather, an identity of I am part of a bigger identity. An, a larger than Earth identity. And that identity is, will change the way people react to each other, will behave. It's, it doesn't take away from being a Russian or a Chinese or an American. It doesn't mean one world or anything like that. 
but your but your 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 conception of yourself as as a person from the United States, as a person as a young person emerging from China and Russia, is not going to be us versus them. It's going to be very different. Okay, and and that is where uh, where we are are definitely uh, uh, going. Okay, that's where we must go. But we have to get through this period of chaos, which is coming. This period of not having uh, Trump put together the policy yet. It's not put on the table. The Chinese are very nervous right now. The Chinese are very nervous because while they understand that the World Trade Organization is not good, they have essentially made uh, a pact with it and, are, you, and, are, and are, are using it. And they don't necessarily want to give that up with something that they don't really know what it's going to be. The, 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 the Chinese are extremely conservative. They don't, they, uh, they don't like jump into the fire and figure it out. Uh, they want to see some idea of where this is going to go. So this is all coming into the G20 meeting. So anyhow, so that's, that's the big picture and then the bigger picture. And Personally, I've been involved in this for 45 years. Uh, it's quite amazing that this is now happening. 45 years that I've been working on this. Uh, and then approximately 44 years since the first ideas emerged from the movement that I joined 45 years ago of, a, of, a, of this kind of world that needed to come into being. So that's 44 years from 1975 to now that this, these ideas, these economic ideas, this, these combination of the nation state uh, and so forth. So how is this going to look? Okay. That has to be worked out. But what LaRouche is proposing in the New Bretton Woods is that you go from a monetary system to a credit system. And what does that mean? That means you do not have an international monetary system. Rather, you have a national credit system in every nation. And then goods are exchanged by exchanging currencies at a relatively fixed rate. So, if so-and-so wants to buy so-and-so from you, or you want to make long-term investment, you do it in your own currency. You pay in your own currency. But that, that currency is, is at a relatively fixed rate with other currencies. So essentially, you have a clearinghouse. And each country has a clearinghouse where they clear all these other currencies with their own currency. And for trade, there is no speculation. That's the whole point. And that's what a credit system is. The, a nation creates the money or creates the credit for infrastructure, for development, or for, for the economic activity. That credit is used in a productive way. And the idea is then when you do trade, you're, you're, you're trading what one country is producing for another country you don't go through a, 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 a monetary system. You don't go through a financial speculative system where hedge funds are killing the currencies. Hedge funds are, ki are using derivatives to further kill the currencies. You go, so you, you have financial stability and you have development. It's, and that's the kind of system that Franklin Delano Roosevelt tried to set up in the post-war period where you had a fixed exchange system with a gold uh, with a gold um, uh, uh, point of point of reference, but that got busted up in seventy one, and ended up being completely abolished in seventy three, and that's when the offshore financial system and the offshore monetary system took, began to take over the world, and that's what the empire is. That's what we're dealing with, and that system will not allow an America to develop or European countries to develop. And because they didn't have control over China, China was able to develop, but they want to end that. And that's what this whole trade fight's about. It's not about trade. So that's where we are. The big picture and the bigger picture.